So again, good afternoon, um, everybody, and good morning for who is joining us from uh, um, uh, the other side of the world, and good evening. Um, so uh, my name is Alessandra Proto. I am the head of the OECD Trento Center for Local Development, which is uh, uh, based uh, in Italy, in the city of Trento. And um, the center is part of the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities of the OECD. Um, welcome to this uh, um, webinar on the internationalization on, of smart specialization strategies. Um, I'm, I'm really very happy um, to welcoming you to this event. Uh, my role all here will really be just to uh, keep time. I will maybe be a bit uh, strict in trying to uh, respect the schedule th that we have because we know we our time is uh, very precious. So please, uh, I should already um, ask, apologize to the speakers in case I would uh, interrupt them, but trying to keep uh, to keep timing. Um, also, I would like to inform you that this event is a very nice uh, um, part of the uh, OECD Local Development uh, uh, Forum uh, initiative, which is uh, um, a network of thousands of individuals uh, uh, worldwide that are um, sharing uh, uh, with the OECD their interest and willingness of having uh, a more resilient and inclusive and sustainable societies and territories. Um, so before uh, um, any further delay, I uh, uh, would like to um, pass the floor to um, Sandra Sodini, who is the head of the International uh, um, Relation Unit, sorry, uh, the Unit for International Relation and European Union Programming of the region Friuli Venezia Giulia. Sandra, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Alessandra. Good afternoon, everyone. In these very hot hours, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome you to this uh, digital event, uh, the internationalization of smart specialization strategy, reflecting on the opportunities for the regional innovation system in 20. 21, 2027 period. So I'm confident that the themes that we will touch during this event and all the interesting, uh, our interesting speakers um, will leave us really enriched and ready, I could say, to keep innovating. Unfortunately, our uh, president, Friuli Venezia Giulia president, Mr. Massimiliano Federica, cannot join us, but uh, he had uh, uh, typed a short uh, welcoming addressing. And uh, therefore, I kindly ask uh, if it is possible to launch it. Thanks a lot. L'economia della regione Friuli Venezia Giulia si caratterizza, tra gli altri, per due aspetti significativi una spiccata vocazione all'export e un'importante dotazione di strutture per la ricerca, il trasferimento tecnologico e l'innovazione. Sono due caratteristiche che collocano la nostra regione ai primi posti fra le regioni italiane, prima fra le regioni italiane nel Regional Innovation Scoreboard dell'Unione Europea. Risulta quindi evidente come il nesso tra innovazione e internazionalizzazione assuma per la nostra regione una valenza particolarmente significativa, soprattutto guardando alle prospettive della ripresa dopo la pandemia e alla necessità di costruire un sistema economico più resiliente per il futuro. In periodi come questo sarebbe poco saggio adagiarsi sugli allori dei buoni risultati ottenuti rispetto alle altre regioni. È invece necessario guardare da vicino, con attenzione a come stia funzionando realmente il nostro sistema, quali ne siano i punti di forza, ne ho appena elencati due, ma anche identificandone le eventuali debolezze. Solo così si può agire prontamente, facendo leva sugli indubbi aspetti positivi per superarle. Questo atteggiamento, che sarebbe dettato dalla saggezza in condizioni normali, diventa un imperativo nelle attuali condizioni eccezionali. 
In questo contesto si colloca la scelta strategica che la Regione ha fatto di stabilire una collaborazione con Ocse per sviluppare un'analisi sulle prospettive dell'ecosistema economico regionale guardando proprio al rapporto tra internazionalizzazione e innovazione. L'occasione è stata offerta dai nuovi criteri richiesti dalla Commissione europea per la preparazione della nuova strategia di specializzazione intelligente che la Regione sta elaborando. Ritengo però che questa condizione posta dalla Commissione debba rappresentare per noi un'opportunità per sviluppare un ragionamento che guardi al nostro futuro anche allargando il punto visuale e ponendoci a confronto con altre esperienze a livello europeo da cui trarre ispirazione. È infatti essenziale, come dire, parte intrinseca degli stessi processi di internazionalizzazione comprendere quali siano le ragioni e le motivazioni che stanno alla base dell'evoluzione delle politiche dell'innovazione a livello europeo. Per fare questo dobbiamo considerare la visione sulle tematiche sia delle istituzioni europee che del governo italiano, come pure le riflessioni che emergono da parte degli studiosi. Ed è poi particolarmente utile guardare da vicino e porsi a confronto con le altre amministrazioni e realtà territoriali che stanno affrontando come noi l'evoluzione delle loro strategie di specializzazione intelligente e la loro proiezione internazionale. Ed eccoci quindi al seminario di oggi che l'Ocse e la Regione hanno organizzato quale coronamento del progetto. Desidero approfittare di questa opportunità per ringraziare Ocse, Karen McGuire che interverrà dopo di me, Alessandro Proto che modera i lavori di oggi e lo staff del centro Ocse di Trento con gli esperti che hanno condotto la ricerca per la fruttuosa collaborazione che si è stabilita e consolidata durante la sua realizzazione nell'ultimo anno e mezzo. Un periodo difficile nel quale è stato particolarmente complicato portare a compimento il lavoro di ricerca. Ma così è stato e di questo devo ringraziarvi. D'altro canto è proprio in queste fasi che bisogna avere la forza e il coraggio di guardare più lontano, unire le forze e costruire le premesse per progettare il rilancio. Il seminario di oggi si propone quindi di offrire uno spazio di confronto internazionale sulle prospettive che si aprono per i sistemi regionali e nazionali dell'innovazione nella programmazione 21-27 e nella fase della ripresa e rilancio dopo il terribile impatto della pandemia. L'innovazione sarà evidentemente, come ho già avuto modo di sottolineare, un fattore di leva essenziale per questa fase. Do quindi il benvenuto a tutti gli intervenuti, in particolare a quelli della regione che rappresento e agli illustri relatori, rappresentati dalla Commissione europea, dal governo italiano e dalla ricerca accademica che interneranno nel corso dei lavori. Mi occorre l'obbligo infine di ringraziare i funzionari dell'equipe della regione che hanno fattivamente supportato questo importante lavoro di ricerca. Vi ringrazio tutti per l'interesse e motivazione a partecipare e vi auguro buon lavoro. Very good. I now invite uh, again for the welcome and opening uh, Karen McGuire, the head of the Local Employment Skills and Social Inclusion Division of the OECD. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alessandra, and thank you, uh, Sandra Sordini, for representing the region today for us. And please extend our, our great appreciation to uh, President Rodriguez for his opening remarks uh, via video, and also for the longstanding collaboration uh, we have, uh, th especially through the um, OECD Trento Center with, uh, with the region in terms of capacity building for local economic development, this particular study on uh, smart specialization, as well as being a partner of that OECD local development forum in the context in which um, today's event takes place. Um, so I, as was mentioned, I oversee a program that looks at local employment and economic development. And it's really a place within the OECD that for the last um, 40 years uh, next year has been thinking about how to support economic development in cities and regions. And so this is really a you know, uh, sort of the um, on the vanguard of some of the thinking on these issues. And um, I just flagged that the OECD actually started working on um, sort of precursor ideas on this in regional innovation systems uh, starting well over 15 years ago. So there's a, and even prior to that, when thinking about working with uh, clusters and SMEs and other aspects that are important for internationalization from subnational uh, perspectives. So there's a body of work. And I also encourage you to check out the upcoming publication uh, associated with today's case, as well as a recent report um, that was done in collaboration with the Commission on Broad-Based Innovation Policy for all regions and cities. Uh, but today we're really focusing in on the internationalization element. And it's really, uh, I think it's interesting for us, especially in this context with COVID um, and other aspects of how we promote different elements of internationalization and how we do that 
not just for the big firms, not just for the leading universities, um, but throughout the regional economies. And so this is really, uh, in a sense, the next steps um, for all of us to focus our attention and energy. And uh, you'll hear from Paolo Rosso a little bit later today, some of the different elements. And as the president just mentioned in his address, um, you know, a lot of uh, strong rankings of the region in the innovation scoreboard in terms of uh, trade, um, but different opportunities to improve uh, uh, this internationalization perspective. And we'll also hear in a few moments, um, Simona give us a, her perspective because she's also done some research looking in particular at um, the region and what can be done to support internationalization. So as we're thinking about, you know, sort of the next generation um, with the European Green New Deal, with new cohesion policies, with our sort of post-COVID environment, it'll be really uh, exciting to learn about what actions are being taken to promote these local to local uh, collaborations. And so for today, we have two panels to really help us do that. So first is to give us a little bit of a big picture context. And so Peter Verkovitz, head of unit um, in the commission in DG Regio is gonna give us a bit of a perspective on S3, uh, which he oversees, but also the interregional innovation investments and some insights in uh, the new phase of uh, cohesion policy. I'm sure everyone's interested in hearing about those. Um, Simona Imarino will give us a bit of a perspective of her research um, in particular on this issue, a long-standing body of research, but also a zoom in on, um, in particular, Friuli Venezia Giulia um, to help complement the discussion. And then we'll have uh, Tito Bianchi give us a perspective from Italy, kind of cross-cutting uh, this innovation theme across the country. Then we'll be able to zoom in into some perspectives at the regional level and look forward to hearing from three different regions, uh, Centre Val de Loire in France, which I am now a part-time resident, resident of, so I look forward to hearing about the activities there. Um, the uh, region of Catalonia, which has a long-standing history in supporting regional innovation systems, and I think we'll hear more about uh, transformative innovation and sustainable S3 uh, strategies, or S4. Um, and then Upper Austria, who has also a very long tradition of international activities and how it's taking it to the next uh, phase. So I really thank uh, all of the speakers and panelists for being here and look forward to an interesting discussion. And as uh, Alessandro mentioned, please feel free to use the question and answer uh, approach to um, engage with our different sets of panelists. So thank you so much and um, pass the floor back to Alessandra to launch panel one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, yes, I should also add that in the uh, case studies and panel discussion, there will also be the presentation of the work that we have done on uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia as setting the scene. Um, but now I just give the floor to uh, Peter Berkowitz, who is uh, the um, head of unit in DG Regio, and he's in charge of smart and sustainable uh, um, growth. So Peter, the, the floor is yours. Right. Well, good, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, with colleagues and friends from the OECD, and of course from from different regions. Different regions. I see some some some, some faces that I know very well. So it's it's a, it's a, uh, I'm really looking forward to to the discussion today. Now, really, what I want to try uh, and do is just give you a very very quick overview of where we really stand in our thinking about internationalization and, and smart specialization. And uh, of course, you know, this is a very, very big topic and it's something which is moving very quickly. So uh, it'll really be a kind of a, a, a quick overview, but it is a topic which we really think is, uh, is central um, to, uh, to the development of smart specialization. And, and we really very much welcome this work done, uh, done together. With, the, with you, and um, and of course, this is work in progress, and I think that's the most important thing. Is and, and I think that you'll see as I get back to the to, to my conclusions uh, that it's a new area of policy development. Uh, so let me let me just see if my screen will work. Yeah, no. So starting point, of course, is our new approach to smart specialization. In, uh, in cohesion policy. And this is the enabling condition, um, which is essentially the framework for smart specialization. Um, and there are two things that we're trying to do for the new period. The first is to improve governance. Um, 
and to really consolidate what has been achieved in the current period, but at the same time to make it more of a forward-looking instrument. And as a result, there are some new elements in there. And the new element which is most relevant to, to this is, is the, the last one you see there, which is uh, the requirement for each smart specialization partnership to identify measures to enhance cooperation with partners outside a given member state and linked to the smart specialization strategy. Now, we, we see, um, this is a survey that we did in 2020, um, you know, most, most regions are, are actually actively reflecting on this. Um, I mean, there's something going on in one member state in Southeastern Europe, which is the red, uh, which, uh, which will, we seem to have a bit of a problem with the idea, but elsewhere, green and, 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 and pink represent, as it were, an engagement in this area. So it's something which is, which is going on across Europe. Um, now, what I want to do here, just a very, very quick survey of, um, of, of what And what, we, what we mean uh, when we talk about internationalization. And, and that is actually, there are kind of three, three approaches. Uh, and we're seeing a mix of these different approaches in, 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 the, in the current period and moving into the future. And this is what the policy instruments are trying to address. Uh, but as I said right at the start, start. Area policy. Now it's going on for many years, I'd say, uh, you know, typically from the 80s and the 90s, and of course, Porter, uh, and, and the development of a whole range of, of SME services, information, promotion, financial support, uh, inward investment support, uh, specifically to bring in, in, in other, other larger companies, um, counseling, and, and of course, in a European context, context support to participation in international research projects. And this is something we also have a survey. I actually have dug out a survey from 2004, which already showed that most member states were making use of most of these, 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 these instruments. Um, but of course, there are new approaches out there. And um, this, um, I, I, I would say, is what I probably char characterize. I'm sure Simona is going to say, um, uh, more about this is, is the FDI GBC global production network approach to linkages and spillovers, where the conceptualization um, is really one of how do you insert regions into uh, international linkages? And you can, there are different models. This, in fact, is a piece of, of work we're currently doing with another part of the uh, of, of, of CFE and also the, the investment committee, um, which is looking at FDI diffusion channels. And the different elements. But in policy terms, we see this as well as, as increasingly an important dimension of what we're doing in smart specialization. Smart specialization is not just endogenous development, but it is something which is also about creating these linkages, particularly in smart specialization areas. So this is the second, the second approach to internationalization. Um, the third, um, for the lack of a better name, I've, I've called it inter, interregional linkages and complementary spe specialization capabilities. Um, and this is very much an extension of the smart specialization approach outside the region to the notion of div diversification pathways in combination with other regions. And, and this is some work which we, we did with, with uh, Ron Boschmer and Pierre Alex Balland. Um, and I mean, methodology rather complicated, but, but essentially what it tries to do is it tries to identify where there are complementarities between different regions in specific areas. And this is a map of uh, batteries and batteries technologies. We looked at, uh, at, at seven key technologies and, and this shows regions which display strong um, diversification uh, possibilities in a complementary manner. So the idea here, I mean, is, is that there are potentially bits of innovation systems in other regions which can complement what is going on uh, in a specific region. Um, and I mean, this can be knowledge, but this can also be institutional. So, I mean, this may be demonstrators, 
and SMEs active in a certain field. Here, the, the, the lens has essentially been um, through, uh, through patents, brands, and other types of economic activity that we have been looking at. This, this I think, if I remember correctly, is patents. Um, but it goes beyond that. And, and this, I think, is, is the key policy idea um, which we're trying to promote uh, through smart specialization is that there is a possibility to reinforce complementarities within the European single market, particularly in areas which are of critical importance uh, to European industry. Uh, now, we have these, this, these are essentially the, the underlying ideas. And it has been integrated into a new instrument, uh, which is an interregional innovation instrument. And the interregional innovation instrument is essentially, you'll see this in a second, about the second two of these models of internationalization that we talked about. And the focus is very much on using the linkages between regions active in smart specialization strategies uh, to work together in areas of similar value chains uh, and building a interregional quadruple helix beyond regional boundaries. Now, just to say we have a very small budget for it, we have about 570 million euros. Uh, and it will be implemented together with in the new innovation agency, together with uh, uh, the EIC. Um, and we're really trying to test here whether it is possible to design instruments to, su to support this type of new types of complementarity. Uh, and, and it will have two strands to the work. The first strand corresponds more to the comp what, I, what, what I call the complementary capabilities approach in specialization areas where we have existing partnerships. And of course, in Italy, this is known very well. I mean, the, the Vanguard initiative has been uh, behind this. Uh, but we are also focusing uh, on less developed regions. And here we see the FDI global value chain paradigm, which I discussed as particularly relevant because of course there we're trying to connect uh, innovation systems together with um, uh, uh, with uh, international linkages. So just to come to a, to a conclusion, a much stronger focus on internationalization and smart specialization, looking beyond the region. There are different approaches and we have to try and tease out these different approaches. Um, there is a strong linkage between the discussion in regional policy and the discussion on uh, research and industrial policy. And there's a very confused discussion going on at on European level uh, about innovation ecosystems, uh, where DG Research has a view, uh, our colleagues in DG Grow have a view, uh, and the Commission will probably come out on something to clarify this in a bit. We have new tools available to support this process. Um, and in this respect, just one thing that I wanted to say is very, very important. This I3 instrument, which I described very briefly, does not replace the programs. It is there to do the things that the programs cannot do. So what we would like the programs to do is to do their best to internationalize and the I3 instrument to come in where there are particular problems and market failures. And the last message, uh, and perhaps this allows us to make the transition to Simona, is that we need to significantly improve the analytical basis for this type of activity. Uh, it is really a new field and we don't yet have the tools to do it uh, properly. I'll finish there. I hope I was not too long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, perfect timing, I must say, and very interesting information. Um, so I now um, pass the floor to Professor Simona Yamarino. She is a, a professor of economic geography at the London School of Economics. Um, and she had done a lot of work uh, on the smart specialization strategy um, and uh, as well as on, uh, uh, on Friuli Venezia Giulia. Um, so uh, yeah, Simona, the floor, the floor is yours. And yeah, you have also 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, and the screen is fine, right? It's, uh, yeah, I, I saw, is, is okay? Can you, can you? Everything is fine. Perfect. 
So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure and a an honor. And uh, yes, I will, uh, uh, in the short time I have, I will uh, try to reconnect, obviously, with Peter. We, we're working together also in this respect. Uh, we have been for a while. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, technological change and globalization, we know, create this interdependence in the division of labor. And this is very, very relevant at the local, regional level. And uh, what we call regional connectivity is uh, regional exposure to inflows and outflows of various kinds. So asset, knowledge, capabilities, expertise from and towards the rest of the world. This has, these dynamic processes, have the power to change substantially uh, the regional economic and institutional advantages. So they should be seen uh, as, as a whole. And therefore, I mean, the measures that we have uh, so far are very, very limited also to capture uh, connectivity in, in its all. But the European integration has shown very, very strong patterns of interdependence within the area. And as Peter was saying, we know still very little, which is obviously the lack uh, creates a lack of uh, informative base for policy that is one of the most severe, I would say. Uh, and therefore, we have not a full-fledged uh, uh, integration of connectivity in the wider sense into uh, uh, regional development policies and smart specialization uh, strategies. Now, I will show you some indicators that are the only one for the moment because I know that uh, the TIVA the indicators by OECD are in the process of being regionalized, for example, that would be wonderful. Uh, but for the moment, I mean, looking at foreign direct investment, Greenfield, the simple proxy that can have, you know, can give us a general idea. What we see in Europe is that both for inward, the reddish yellow map, and the outward, which is the blue green map, I mean, there are significant regional uh, variation and heterogeneity. We see that the center of uh, the, the most connected region, inward and outward, are obviously the, the usual one. There is a strong polarization. So uh, um, city, cities, big cities, big metropolitan areas, uh, or with high level of incomes, or very strong industrial uh, 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 territories uh, uh, with uh, a strong intensity of R&D or also some uh, of the poorest regions on the on the eastern part of the union uh, this is for inward outward actually shows even more polarization and we see that the center of excellence are those that show bilateral connectivity so both sides which is an indicator of successful let's say places are in fact connected both ways which is uh, bears a very strong implication for policy because so far we have seen only attractiveness as a policy modalities. Um, looking at the Italian case in particular and focusing on Friuli Venezia Giulia, uh, we can say that, uh, uh, well, the Italian case is again very polarized because we see that, for example, four regions, Lombardia, Lazio, Emilia, Romagna and Piemonte, the top four are, you know, accounting for almost 60% of inward FDI. This is, this is the cumulative flows uh, of, uh, between 2003 in 2017, we are using the FDI market database that allows for international comparisons, while for OFDI, this polarization is even stronger because the four regions account for more than 85%. Friuli Venezia Giulia is not uh, very uh, uh, well positioned in general. I mean, it has a modest share of uh, IFDI, very low share of OFDI, and more generally looking at other sources, for example, I mean, we know that only 1.6% in the in 2000. 15 was, uh, uh, you know, was uh, uh, foreign owned, one of the, uh, the lowest share for the north of Italy and one of the lowest for Italy as a whole. So internationalization generally, also active internationalization is not a prominent feature of the region. Now, I want to show you 
some also of the potential the potential to understand better this kind of uh, uh, networks and implication just fdi which is greenfield fdi so very limited proxy but we can see that it can be looked at by function for example so it tells us you know what are the function that the region is able to attract and what are the functions that are in a way leaving the region which is not necessarily a bad thing, but the two aspects has have to be put together in order to really understand what is the implication for the region. Because uh, normally outward flows are seen perceived as a negative thing, so activities that leave the region and do not leave behind anything else. But we know from the theory and the uh, empirics at the national level that this is not necessarily the case, and that actually. Uh, uh, internationalization uh, uh, through FDI uh, uh, of some activities and function can generate even positive results. It depends on the places and, all, for example, also of the industry. Here, Friuli Venezia Giulia on the FDI market data show a very, very strong attractiveness in coal, oil, natural gas, followed by consumer product, okay? And that is something that aligned with the specialization. Uh, on the other hand, we can see that uh, the spread of the outward flows, for example, financial services is uh, quite prominent. And therefore, I mean, my point here is just to understand also what kind of policies. It is very, very important to understand what gets in, what gets out, and compare at different levels. So my uh, conclusion would uh, uh, re re uh, recall what in a study with Mike Otos from the Bank of Italy, actually, Tiziana uh, Vittorino and, uh, sorry, Tiziana Sodano uh, and Giuseppe Vittorino is very important important uh, to, to, to understand. I mean, I know, I mean, I heard that the scoreboards are offering a, a positive picture of Friuli Venezia Giulia, which is uh, very exciting to hear. But in our study that was done, uh, looking at the crisis in particular, the, the, the double dip, a big recession and sovereign debt, debt crisis, at the firm level, we uh, saw that there were, the perception of firm was that there were severe financial market offers obstacle that were hampering firms from innovating in, 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 in general terms, and that the barrier that were uh, connected to human resources instead affected both innovators and non-innovators. In general, Friuli Venezia Giulia perception of market risks, and this has a lot to do with internationalization, was very strong, uh, particularly uh, in during the, 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 the sovereign debt crisis, and this reduced and this reduced the propensity to innovate. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the the, uh, the regional investment and export drop in those years was much higher than the rest of Italy. Uh, the region is in the European, let's say, middle income regional groups that has, as we have shown in the works with Andres Rodriguez Pos and Michael Storper, some tough uh, de development challenges. I mean, this is something that, uh, again, uh, we, we developed thanks to the DG region and uh, uh, that it has this uh, strength and weaknesses, okay? A very, a relatively high GDP per capita, quality high of local institutions. On the other hand, skill mismatch and slow growing specialization model. So in, in other words, what uh, it, it should be, and this is again what Peter said, uh, place sensitive, but also multi-level and integrated policy, policy action, okay? Trying to really understand this interaction between innovation and internal, inter internationalization processes and strengthening, this is, this is something that P Peter uh, highlighted before, intra and inter-regional networks. So this is absolutely crucial when we know, or we have at least a rough idea of what these networks are, in order to upgrade uh, the traditional industrial cluster, so not only R&D focused innovation and foster the diversification 
identification, although there are very recent studies that are also actually showing that, you know, specialization in the rat sectors might be even more winning that diversification at all costs. Uh, and uh, uh, this is also something to keep in mind that there is never uh, a model that is winning in absolute terms and overcoming the traditional uh, uh, internationalization promotion based only on let's attract foreign firms because this is not necessarily a winning strategy at both inflows and outflows, not only of firms, but also of human capital, for example, are absolutely complementary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Simona, really very, very interesting and, and focused, uh, focused presentation. So we, we started from the European Commission, we went to a very, uh, uh, from this theoretical uh, presentation of uh, Simone, and now we zoom in uh, in the um, national case. So I here invite uh, um, Mr. Tito Bianco, who represents the Department for Cohesion Policies at the presidency of the Council of Ministries um, in Italy. Tito, uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me see if I manage now to do this successfully, Sh sharing my screen. Okay. Very good. Uh, my, my name is Tito Bianchi. I work, uh, for those who don't know me, I work for the Italian government at the presidency of the Council of Ministers. Dipartimento Politica di Coesione, and I've been asked uh, by colleagues at the OECD to give an overview in 10 minutes, what can be done in 10 minutes, of the evolution, what we expect to be the evolution of the S3 approach in the coming uh, programming period. Let me get my, my meter started so I can trace the timing. Um, basically, well, first of all, thank you Thanks uh, to the OECD for inviting me, but not just for this, just thank you in particular for uh, summoning this very interesting seminar, putting these very intelligent people in the same virtual room to discuss these important issues for the next years. Um, I, uh, I, as I, let me turn, following, I don't know why this is not progressing my presentation. Okay, uh, I've been thinking of how to organize this presentation to be brief and and to focus on the key points of the of the evolution of our S3 strategies, uh, at least from the national point of view. My vantage point, and um, I came up with uh, five uh, principles or focal things to think about uh, when we think about the uh, how S3 strategies should evolve in the coming programming period. The first is continuity. Second is monitoring and evaluation. The third is governance. Fourth is regional disparity. And the fifth is the inter-regional inter actions, the topic of this uh, today's seminar. Uh, without uh, any more delay, I just want to focus on the first uh, principle, well, first of all, continuity, we usually don't think as continuity as being an element of, of uh, innovation or that promotes innovation, but uh, if, if, if we think of continuity in terms of the general framework uh, within which uh, the uh, innovative activity happens, we think that uh, we've been thinking that keeping the same 12 thematic areas at the national level uh, could could enable um, each region and each um, uh, innovation ecosystem to uh, to find its own way to discovering its own uh, technological trajectories and strategies for for innovation and internationalization because entrepreneurial discovery in, uh, in this period that we think should be seen as a more continuous process not something that happens at the beginning of the period and then is to be repeated only years after. So uh, continuity uh, as an element for, um, for evolution. The second point uh, we, I would like to say something about is monitoring and evaluation. Usually uh, I work in this evaluation unit 
but I don't do only evaluation. I'm, I'm very much involved in policy making, especially in the field of innovation and industrial research. Uh, and usually monitoring and evaluation come at the end of presentations. But uh, in this case, I thought it would be uh, important to put them at the center of implementation of, uh, of these policies, because they, they are really an important part of implementation. In, in Italy, we have uh, given responsibility for monitoring to, to uh, the National Cohesion Agency, which periodically reports on the strategies implementation and, and, and the evaluation to a different part of our system, the national evaluation system, which is uh, coordinated by the unit where I work, the evaluation unit, uh, uh, which is, is, has the responsibility to, to bring, bring evidence from um, evaluation, um, uh, evaluation produced at different points in the system and bringing this evidence to feed into an, what it has to be seen as an ongoing information management system. So uh, it's again, monitoring and evaluation are not only observed and used at the end of the policy process, but are nested in the policy process. They are part of it. Uh, um, they are an element so, for its continuous improvement. Sorry, Tito, to interrupting you. Um, yeah. I guess you have your slides, but they're not, uh, we, we can see them advancing maybe you can't see them advancing no that's a problem progressing no then let me so you i see didn't want first... to interrupt you but uh... well, you're right i mean you um what do you see now we just see the title slide mm, let me see what can be what happening? if you just press enter enter yeah, very good. It works. All oh, right, because I was looking at, my, at the wrong screen. Yeah, because two screens normally are distracted. Sorry, because otherwise I'm About eating this. up. So one I, of I, your I covered monitoring and evaluation. I guess. Uh, I mean, this uh, this it's a very simple presentation that can obviously be shared with the audience, uh, if, uh, supposing that they are interesting. Um, then, um, sorry for this inconvenience. I'm not used to using two screens, and I got confused. So I, I was looking at the one that was progressing, but the other one was steady in the first slide. The, the third point I wanted to mention is, is the, the, the governance system. We, we are using, um, we are trying to, to, to strengthen our governance uh, by on the one hand, uh, streamlining it and, 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 and putting the governance uh, of, of S3 inside the, uh, at the top of the, of the governance system of cohesion. Um, we do this by introducing a new uh, subcommittee of the general national cohesion policy uh, monitoring committee, uh, a subcommittee that uh, is, is in charge of S3 implementation, at least uh, uh, follows and reports on the implementation. This monitoring uh, committee, the, the, this S3 committee meets uh, in plenary session uh, at least twice a year uh, with the involvement of all social and economic private stakeholders that are part of the, of the general policy process at the national level. Um, and also uh, we, we have technical groups of this subcommittee that uh, dedicated to three important items, industrial transition, research and innovation, and this digitalization. I think this uh, improvement, uh, from our point of view, this strengthening of governance uh, has, has happened after, on the occasion of, of, of course, of the request for uh, the, uh, the enabling conditions. So I think we should thank the, the EU, the G region in particular, for forcing us to think about the things that could be improved in our system. And, and certainly the governance system that we had in place before was not uh, particularly effective. So that's, uh, that was the reason for us to uh, intervene on, on this. Mm. Now, this has changed. We are going to point four, I hope, this thing, because it doesn't change on my other screen, but uh, a fourth point is very relevant for Italy is, is the issue of regional disparity. 
we cannot uh, in Italy, whatever you do basically, but um, in particular in the case of innovation policy, you cannot assume that all regions uh, have the same pace of innovation, have the same dynamism, or we recognize, we start, we have to start by recognizing that, that the different regions occupy different places in, in international value chains. And so they should, they, they have a different density of actors uh, within those ecosystems. So national policy from our national point of view should focus more actively on the lagging regions to help them uh, leverage inter-regional value chains. We, we really, in our um, coming programming period, we, we tend to see value chains very much in the sense that uh, Professor Jan Marino said before me, of course, more elegantly than, than I could do, uh, that inter-regional value chains can be a force for upgrading of um, different uh, regional ecosystems, depending uh, on, on, on where they are. So um, the national, uh, national policy should, in particular, pay particular attention, uh, attention to the lagging regions. And also for the lagging regions, uh, the issue of skills is especially important. In Italy, lagging regions have, have been drained in their resources for the past years. Uh, they produce valuable human resources and technical um, uh, skills, but they lose them to the advantage of, of uh, more, more powerful uh, regions, both Italian and re European and international. So uh, a focus of policy uh, for these regions in particular, probably for all of them, should be to train and to retain the skills that they uh, very produce with lots of efforts and high costs. Uh, final point before concluding is um, has to do with interregional actions. Again, uh, thank you for posing. Th thank you for, for for posing it at the center of this seminar, and for and th thank you for the to the EU to to giving this an um, a place uh, in the enabling conditions and giving it uh, the center of of so much attention because we also share this view that interregional interventions. Are key. Um, in the past, uh, the regional uh, S3 start strategies have been seen probably too much as uh, policies for, for specific areas outside of a broader international context in which they are placed. And uh, of course, we have the, the fortune of this new uh, in, uh, European tool, the I3, which is from our point of view is, is an important tool in, in particular where networks already exist and it specializes very much on, on, on bringing, on going the last mile, the, the highest TRL numbers, but we, we should put in place a broader array of policies, including policies to, uh, to promote the participation of regional players where they don't participate or they are in the wrong um, in the wrong value chains to enter, to participate in, re, in uh, networks that are more developmental for them, which means they, are, they tend to force and to induce uh, the, the development of, of better uh, technologies and skills for the economic development of the area. Uh, okay, thank you. I think I've exceeded of just one minute my time, but I am excused because of my lack of skills uh, technological Th skills. Thank you very much, Dita. We managed again, at the end. And, uh, okay, um, and, and very interesting uh, presentation. And also the, the issue that you raised is uh, the disparities that, that should be tackled by uh, policies uh, and also by the um, um, smart specialization strategy as an approach is very important. Um, look, before we now pass to the uh, case study and the panel discussion, which is also very interesting and important for us because our idea is always to create this connection and, and, and exchange of experiences. I just should inform uh, maybe also you speakers that in case of questions, we don't have time to reply on that live. So please, if you can just type your um, answers directly in the Q&A um, section. So um, uh, uh, as is written also in the invitation to the workshop, uh, um, this, uh, this event, uh, 
um, was also is also organized because uh, we um, did uh, um, a study with the region, clearly Venezia Giulia, on the internationalization of the smart specialization strategy, and uh, that uh, let's say research part is now concluded. And I invite my colleague Paolo Rosso to provide uh, an overview of the main uh, of the main findings of um, of the project. And then uh, the rest of the session, the panel will be moderated by my colleague, uh, um, Jonathan Potter, and we will invite uh, uh, a number of uh, three different experiences of Europe uh, that will explain also their experience in, um, in uh, how to benefit and how to enhance the uh, and put in place this mass specialization strategy. So thank you, Paolo, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. Thank you very much. Uh everybody, uh, the previous speakers for providing already insights uh, and information very relevant for the few words I'm going to say, which are basically trying to uh, draw my findings uh, out of the study we have made uh, for Friuli Venezia Giulia region uh, over the last year. Um, uh, just the next slide, there are a very few con consideration, a preliminary one, Okay, in general terms, this has been already said, uh, uh, the region uh, is quite well positioned in terms of, uh, at least in terms of national ranking on science, research, uh, technology, innovation. And in a way, the, the challenge is how to make uh, uh, better use, the best use possible of smart specialization as a catalyst for uh, building and strengthening the regional innovation system. This is the reason uh, why the smart specialization is there. Uh, our perception in general terms is that there are still uh, uh, synergies, linkages, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, capacity to work together between, among the different actors which are uh, working on the team in, uh, in the region, which is uh, yet to be strengthened. And this is something that uh, has been already addressed in a way uh, by uh, Simona Iemarino earlier. Um, what we have uh, witness is that uh, uh, the uh, previous smart specialization strategy evolved quite a lot over the five years uh, of implementation, and they the, the region changed, the governance system changed different uh, uh, aspects, uh, the entrepreneurial discovery process was done uh, over the time, and this I think is uh, giving uh, a, a and a good opportunity of learning uh, to the region, which is good for, for the next future. But next, please. The, uh, the, the real point is that uh, uh, on one end, the region has already uh, a quite a, an experience in institutional international relations. Uh, I can be late, I can later to this point. And this can be a good, a good background for evolving a little bit more this internationalization by working together with the uh, local ecosystem of innovation, where there is still something which can be done. So there is a potential there, but uh, uh, yet to be exploited. And the, the next generation of the smart specialization uh, calls for having a, a internationalization become a structural element of the smart specialization, which is not yet. These are basically very roughly some considerations out of our research. Then uh, there are some, uh, some recommendations uh, we have drawn uh, trying to turn uh, this understanding into some points uh, to be further work uh, and consider uh, for the next uh, progr uh, programming period for working on this new uh, smart specialization strategy. The first point is to broaden the international challenge in traditional uh, regional businesses. As a matter of fact, there is a gap to be, to be uh, dealt with uh, between the traditional uh, regional businesses, which is the vast majority, uh, majority of the businesses. For, for them, uh, uh, internationalization is basically export. And uh, the region has a good performance in terms of exports, but uh, there are no other substantial mechanisms other than export uh, in the way the internationalization is perceived by them. There are a smaller number of companies in which, where these uh, dynamics uh, in where in, uh, internationalization, innovation, and uh, networking is already there, but the two systems are not connected. So there is an open challenge 
how to support uh, the bulk of the companies uh, to catch up uh, and uh, learn uh, how to better collaborate in locally for them being more able to deal with international collaboration. This is the first uh, recommendation. So broaden international channels, uh, getting out of the small uh, privileged companies uh, and uh, research and innovation centers where the innovation internationalization is already a reality, but spread over uh, these uh, to other companies and to the wider economic fabric uh, in the larger sense. The next uh, recommendation is uh, related to how to deal with that. Uh, so uh, there, uh, one part of our work uh, has been dealing with uh, the analysis of the bottleneck to innovation diffusion. And what we learned is that um, in uh, the most of the companies uh, were uh, uh, unable to express an explicit demand for innovation or for innovation services. And uh, where they are expressing a, a, a demand for innovation, there are no services they perceive being useful for them. And so there is a mismatch in that, uh, which must be, must be uh, dealt, uh, supporting uh, with the new instrument to be put in place, uh, such as technology brokerage, uh, international networking, support to international network. Uh, there is a, a, the need of acting in order to uh, facilitate processes of demand articulation, which is really a, a point for, for become, having the innovation in internationalization become an opportunity to, from which to, to move forward. The next recommendation uh, is uh, related uh, to uh, the need of uh, building jointly a middle-term vision for the internationalization of the innovation system. As a matter of fact, the point here is that uh, um, the, most of the stakeholders we interviewed uh, they are not fully involved at all stages uh, in the internationalization innovation. And therefore, it's quite important in order to improve uh, the overall uh, functioning of the system to uh, uh, design in a more um, um, involving way uh, the midterm perspective, because uh, the lack of having a commonly shared midterm vision is affecting most of the people, most of the actors, which are not working together, are instead self-reliant and working in a separate way. This leads us to the next uh, 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 recommendation, that is to embrace a bottom-up approach in the governance system. The governance has been uh, uh, recalled uh, uh, by Peter Berkowitz, uh, by uh, Tito Bianchi at national level, and also by Simona Yamarino as being a, 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 a challenge. And indeed, indeed is a challenge. So the uh, governance system must be more bottom-up uh, oriented in order to ensure that all the interests, the local interests, all the representatives, the stakeholders are really deeply involved at all stages in the in the in the innovation processes, and this uh, is in a way uh, uh, might be facilitated by really incorporating the quadruple helix principle into the way that the continuous entrepreneurial discovery process is going to be dealt in the future, because this is really a challenge. The fifth oui, recommendation. I speak it too, too, too loud. Okay. If I understand, there was a French comment uh, that I will. Uh, the, okay, the fifth recommendation is uh, to build better capacity for regional innovation and international projections. This has been already mentioned earlier. When we are dealing, we, we are considering uh, capacity building here, we are not just uh, dealing and referring to the skills which is also an issue in the different actors. But this uh, to build a, a, the system in a way that the different players are more aware about the, the role in a wider ecosystem. Policy makers, universities, research center, the technology parks, the clusters as well. All of them 
shed, in a way, should move out from the comfort zone that where they were used to work for a long time and try to operate in a different way. Uh, deeper in, for instance, deeper engagement at territorial level of universities as a centers, uh, the policymakers be more open to experimentation, uh, the technology parts uh, being a little bit more active in reaching out to the companies, uh, the clusters uh, which are actually acting as demand supplies interface should be able to reach more the companies and to bring these companies to the international innovation providers. The sixth uh, uh, Sorry, Paolo, I'm just a bit cautious of time. I, if I'm you taking can too much time. Thank you. Yes, okay. I have two points more. One is about uh, the uh, improve the technical skills inside the region. The point uh, here is that uh, in order to be prompt uh, to act and react to the always moving uh, uh, situation is highly needed to incorporate more skills inside the region. The, the, the region currently, the government is, uh, uh, of course, relying in a number of external consultancy research institutions, but this is always uh, causing a certain delay from where the things are learned and when they are ready to act. Instead, instead there is a need of having more uh, prompt capacity to act. This requires more analytical skill inside the same region. Coming to the, uh, I have two more uh, recommendations. The first one is the regional insertion in the international networks and platforms. Uh, there has been an improvement over the last few years, uh, and uh, this uh, has to, uh, is referred to the smart specialization thematic platform, as well as the Vanguard initiative that was also mentioned earlier by Peter Berko Berkowitz. This is actually something which is highly relevant, to invest more in this uh, and to have the ones who are represented the, representing the region into these networks then to be part of the circulation of communication and information inside the region. Because most often, the ones who are active in these networks, they are not spreading the benefit and the information outside their own uh, uh, small circle. And this uh, is also relevant in terms of having a, a better, making a better use of the inter the European territorial cooperation by linking it uh, to the mainstream of the structural funds. Uh, this is something which is, uh, uh, there is room for improving that uh, and to making more uh, consistent the action of the, the territorial cooperation towards uh, this, the regional base uh, structural funds program. And this has also to, to deal with the, the other European programs such as uh, Horizon Europe and others. No, so a more integrated approach. The last one for having this happening is to strengthen the policy guidance role of the region for mass specialization internationalization. For that, basically, what we suggest is to set up as an option an internationalization steering committee, a standing committee able to address this, not a, bureauc a, a further bureaucratic burden, but a functional uh, body able to keep this coordination uh, working over the time and not just during the uh, programming period, the me meaning the time where the programs and the strategy is conceived and designed, but also over the implementation of the strategy. This is particularly important and relevant. And that's it for my side. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking Thank too you. much time. Thank you, Paolo. Um, I'm miserably failing in trying to keep the right timing, but it was also due for some technical uh, technical issues at the beginning. So now I just pass the, the floor uh, to uh, my colleague, uh, Jonathan uh, Potter, um, who is the head of the Entrepreneurship Policy and Analysis Unit at the OECD. Um, and uh, please, John, the floor, the floor is yours and the debate is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. We'd like to have a debate with some regions uh, that have joined us, um, some interesting regions from uh, France, Spain and Austria. Uh, just uh, before I, I put the, the first question to, to France, I would say that uh, please notice that there are some questions uh, in the questions and answers, uh, particularly, you know, the speakers here, because there are questions that uh, demand uh, a written response. We're not being, being able to take the, the questions live. So uh, we, we'd like uh, written responses to those. Um, why is France doing well? 
Um, how's internationalization impacted on the priorities in Italy? Uh, how does the FDI policy align with the strategic autonomy objective of the EU? Uh, what's been the role of DIHs in FVG? So if you can answer those, have a go. Anybody can, can have a go at the answers. But the, the first question uh, now is, is for Natalie, uh, Natalie Boulanger uh, from um, Centre Val de Loire. So uh, could you tell us a bit about what you learned from the smart specialization strategy in the last period, 2014 to 2020? You know, how did it go? Anything you would do differently? Okay, so thank you for that. First, thank you for inviting me. It's a, also a pleasure and an hour honor. Uh, if I had to uh, highlight few success factors on the implementation of smart specialization, I would uh, firstly mention the alignment of innovation strategies and the involvement of uh, regional uh, political leaders at uh, the highest level. And the second success factors from our experience is the coordination and the professionalization of the economic development ecosystem. In uh, Centre Val de Loire, it is not specially, uh, specifically devoted to the risk free priority management but uh, to the whole economy. The network of the uh, economic developers is a proximity network managed locally with more, uh, more than uh, 300 members. They belong to the regional public and para-public organizations in charge of economic development. And they are responsible for supporting SMEs in their innovation and their development efforts. Nevertheless, uh, to induce structural changes into the risk free priorities themselves and really carry out uh, the dedicated action planned, uh, we needed to have a driving force, a sort of pilot in the plane. So, so the first uh, element of uh, this driving force was the policy mix designed by the policymakers and the stakeholders. It gave the legitimacy to support actions and it uh, had a structuring effect on the approach that has uh, been put in place. However, the midterm evaluation of our risk free and uh, uh, the benchmarking down through uh, some interregular projects showed uh, to us that it was not sufficient. And uh, the second element of the driving force is the coordination of the risk free priority ecosystem by an organization that has the credibility with the rest of the community and the real capacity to induce and to conduct change. And this is the reason why, as a policy, uh, policy uh, decision makers, uh, decided to entrust the management of the risk free priorities to the clusters of the domain concerned but under the leadership of DevOps and DevOps is the uh, Economic Development uh, Agency, which ensures the coherence and the cohesion of the overall management. So to conclude from our experience, capacity building is the first step of, uh, for designing a risk-free and it is particularly important for the innovation ecosystem management, but uh, above all for the coordination of the risk-free priorities. And it should be driven by a governance the more current as possible between the authorities in charge uh, of innovation. Nevertheless, the innovation of the regional stakeholder through the entrepreneurial discovery process is also a critical factor of uh, success. So from my part, it's all. Well, that, that's great. Um, so we need a driver, we need some coordination um, we can use cluster uh, management organizations. Um, and if there are several, then a regional development agency could help put that together. Um, that's great. Uh, Tatiana from Catalonia, uh, what's been your experience? What went well and, and not so well? Thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon. So in 2014, when we were defining the smart specialization strategies, and not many people understood what these strategies were about. And we were concentrated on complying with the requirements of its ante conditionality and discussing also and selecting the priorities for research and innovation. And lots of efforts were also put into the consultation and engagement processes with quadruple helix stakeholders. 
And I think that in most regions, these processes were quite inward looking. What were our capacities? What were our priorities? How could we improve the competitiveness of our companies with EU funds? Internationalization has always been present in discussions related to small specialization strategies, but I think that internationalization policies did not change much as a result of S3. In the case of Catalonia, we already had units in our administration providing support to companies and to universities to build European networks and to have access to EU funds and to internationalize. So I think that maybe Horizon 2020 has done much more than smart specialization strategies to internationalize our research and innovation ecosystem. For example, in our case, in the period 2014-20, more than 900 Catalan entities had obtained almost 2,000 million euros from Horizon 2020, collaborating with more than 11,000 partners outside Catalonia. This can be designed as a big success. So regarding the second part of your question, about what we will change in this period, I would say that the creation of synergies and complementarities between regional and new competitive funds has been a focus of debate for a long time in Europe, but I'm not quite so sure if there have been many progresses at the implementation level. In this new period, we intend to have a more active role encouraging the participation of Catalan actors in European networks and initiatives. And we also intend to have a more active role encouraging a smarter and more effective use of available EU funds for transformative projects and initiatives related to the green and digital transitions and to societal challenges. So uh, in this period, we have Horizon Europe, transnational initiatives and projects. We have the new interreg programs addressing the SDGs and also addressing international value change. And we also have the next generation funds and the regional funds. So in this context, regions have the challenge and have also the responsibility of making good use of all these different funds, maximizing their value for our territories and for Europe also. And many of the most relevant societal challenges, such as climate change or aging population, are common to all regions. Therefore, it's pretty clear that all territories would will be better off if European actors work together to address these common challenges in more effective ways. And this is if they work toward these challenges with an international logic. And we are exploring in Catalonia how mission-oriented policies can help to align international efforts to address these common challenges in more effective ways. We usually talk about international value change in relation to companies and research and innovation, but maybe it's time to start talking about international value change in relation to solutions and to alter and alternatives to current and sustainable practices. This is international value change to address societal challenges more effectively. Thank you. Well, that's very interesting. So um, consultation uh, was important in the last period, uh, but quite inward looking. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> what you're saying is, is it's important to have a more active role of, of all the players in the region, in the EU networks and the international initiatives, um, and especially in the mission-oriented policies. Um, so that's very interesting. So now we move on to uh, Christoph from Upper Austria. Tell us about your experience. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and in principle, I want to share with you some experience, some bad practices, some good practices, what we did uh, around our smart specialization strategy. In principle, Erpa Austria has a smart specialization strategy in place since 1998. Each uh, smart specialization strategy ran for around about five years and set up on the previous one. So the first one dealt with uh, setting up the clusters in our region, the next one with the professionalization of clusters. But then we learned 
that we need to streamline it with the activities on European level and consequently streamlined it with the Horizon 2020 framework from 2014 till 2020. If we look a little bit deeper, then we have made, they made some mistakes uh, between 2014 and 16 because the clusters activities were not really um, really synchronized with S3 strategy. Um, and from 2017 onwards, we managed to streamline them pretty well. So the consequence was that the clusters were doing like the business, try to streamline it a bit with the with S3, but not really matching the needs of the S3 pretty much. And consequently, the implementation of the S3 was not that strong as it could be. So consequently, we said for the new um, program, we involved the clusters right from the beginning and developed jointly with them our S3. And um, we moved from a very much, uh, let's say, formally straight, um, straight um, static process to a, let's say, new rolling process. So annually uh, and regularly, our activities are monitored and checked. When we dig now a little bit deeper, uh, how the, did we develop our smart specialization strategy? The latest one is now in place. Uh, it started at the beginning of the year and it has been adopted already and is already running. Uh, we developed jointly with Fraunhofer a scenario analysis on our strengths and uh, did so-called uh, worst, worst case scenarios. So what would happen for our region in case our automotive industry would collapse, for instance, and derived so-called fields of actions jointly with politics, the economy, uh, but also with research. And derived from this, we came to the conclusion of some key areas or say transformative activities in our areas dealing with connected and efficient mobility with systems and technology for the people meaning like for instance um, digital health but also with topics like efficient and sustainable industry and manufacturing dealing with advanced manufacturing but also circular economy topics and everything enabled with um, in the fear framework of digitization digital transformation to make this possible we put the topic of education and, and skills labor uh, into the focus of our attention and derived from these activities uh, we did uh, in the course of the program when it was already running a different kind of studies for instance an automotive study to look how the location might develop um, to remain competitive in the future or another study dealing uh, with a road mapping process for circular economy um, if we now dig deeper on the COVID situation, what did we do uh, in that respect? Uh, there we managed to, um, to make a little amendment on our program. And what did when we did a survey with the different um, um, re, um, res um, researchers, but also in particular with our companies, and came to the conclusion that on the one hand, we need to make our value chains more uh, resilient against such events, also reduce our dependency from some international supply to pre prepare some things in Europe and not everything abroad. And last but not least, we set up in the framework of our smart specialization strategy, so-called calls, where to solve specific issues, for instance, a call on digital health, on technology development in that respect. So that's from my side. Thank you very much. Again, very, very interesting. And the cluster organizations come up again as, as they did for, for France. So, so they are there. You have, you have cluster organizations and um, they can be a part of the smart specialization strategy. Um, and um, the problem that you had was that they weren't actually early on um, in line with, with the strategy. Uh, maybe there were too many. I'm, I'm not sure you streamlined them. You, you, you tried to involve the cluster organizations from the, the beginning uh, in, in um, going forward. And um, you did scenario planning and, and studies and, and calls on specific issues. So, so that's good. I mean, we're, we're short on time, but 
this event is really about internationalization. So I'm quickly going to ask you about internationalization. Um, so Natalie, um, how do you think that your region can uh, integrate internationalization into your next uh, plan? Yeah, so I propose uh, uh, to illustrate how uh, we um, internationalize a little bit uh, our risk free priorities uh, through three concrete examples. The, 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 yes, the two first are more uh, related to the S3 thematic platforms we launch with uh, our regional counterpart. And the last one is uh, related to the European Digital Innovation Hub. So first, uh, as part of our first priorities dedicated to uh, environmental metrology, um, the Centre of the Loire region has launched a thematic platform uh, with its uh, counterpart regions of Aragon in Spain and Friesland in the Netherlands. Uh, Water Smart Territories, it is the name of the platform, brings uh, 19 regions together to tackle uh, Europeans. Uh, water challenges and the S3 thematic platform have four main objectives to address these challenges. The first one is boosting resilient infrastructure. Then the second one is digitalization. The third one is circular economy. And the fourth one is uh, the enabling of uh, multi-stakeholder governance. And in concrete terms, there are five working groups that have been set up to work on these uh, four objectives. But Furthermore, two types of collaboration were carried out in the framework of uh, Water Smart Territories in 2020. Firstly, the partners have developed two European project proposals, and secondly, they started to work on the policy alignment. Uh, so partnership regions have agree agreed to align their risk-free to enhance the effectiveness of, of uh, interregional collaboration. Uh, so, so uh, Water Smart Territories is also co collaborating in the development of uh, the European Water for All Partnership uh, as part of uh, 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 Horizon for Europe. Uh, and uh, they are working on a joint proposition uh, from the uh, three leading regions on the interregional uh, inter innovation investment instrument. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in partnership with the Lombardy region and six other European regions, we are going to launch another uh, S3 thematic platform dedicated to the cosmetic industry. Uh, it was uh, just validated by the European uh, Commission one uh, month ago. Uh, the platform Go for Cosmetics will promote the development of the entire cosmetic value chains. And it will play a central role uh, in order to create new solutions and business models to boost the, con uh, the competitiveness of the cosmetic sectors, uh, focusing on three priorities, the digital transition, the green transition, and the consumer and citizen's uh, awareness. So uh, as you have seen, uh, digital transition is one of the major of our uh, three thematic platforms which reflect one of the key challenges of our regional industries. So let's talk rapidly about a way to foster our, uh, our risk free internationalization through the European Digital Innovation Hub. As you know, hundreds of uh, European Digital Innovation Hub are currently being structured across Europe to respond to the call of proposal from the European Commission. Uh, in Centre Val de Loire, we have decided to form a consortium around some of our area of specialization and the implementation uh, of uh, the uh, European Digital Innovation Hub is based on strong will of uh, the regional public de decision maker to have an integra uh, integrated digital transformation tool and carried by a third party, which is uh, also DevOp and linked to the main economic areas of the region and specific specifically uh, on the risk-free priorities. Our main expectation toward uh, the European Digital Innovation Hub in Centre Val de Loire are to foster the articulation between the horizontal measure of our retreat dedicated to the digital transition and the action plan of our risk-free priorities. And the other expectation is to ensure the coordination between the action 
implemented for the digital transition in each specialization areas and by respecting to guide the principle, the data processing and the principle of sustainable development and management of resources. So uh, from our experience, uh, the implementation of the European Digital Innovation Hub implies that the digital transformation is part of the challenges identified by the players in this area of specific, uh, specialization and uh, thanks to the entrepreneurial discovery process. And uh, it also implies that digital transformation will be uh, implemented um, within the action plan of uh, this area of uh, specialization. It also implies that the regional assets in this area exist and are identified according to the principle of smart specialization, which should be fact-based, and that we can build on the governance modalities, uh, which have already been put in place uh, within the field of specialization. And as we wanted to align uh, the main uh, thematic of uh, the European Digital Innovation uh, with the main priorities of our risk free we chose to rely on the same actors to moderate these thematics and rules which coordinated the risk free priorities that are the cluster uh, concerned by the domain. And uh, as with uh, risk free develop, the economic development agency remains the overall leader and the driver. And, okay, uh, I, I think um, we, we've sort of come to the, we've, we've come near to the end. So Alessandra, I don't know if we've got to, time to give Tatiana and Christoph two minutes each or, or if we have to, to wrap yes, up. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, let, let's just have two, two more minutes each and then we just, I will just be very brief in the conclusions. So, so, so Tatiana, you, okay. you've got to try and be very sort of... Um, I will be very briefly. Okay, beyond the traditional policies to support the internationalization of the Catalan economy, with the smart specialization, we are working in three directions. First, through the entrepreneurial discovery process. The entrepreneurial discovery process is a powerful mechanism to engage a collective process for identifying opportunities to adopt mission and challenge-oriented policy processes and practices. So through this entrepreneurial discovery process, we can map connections of the regional S3 priorities, missions and challenges with the national and EU priorities, missions and challenges. So if these priorities and strategies are aligned, there will be more opportunities for internationalization. And as Peter Berkovich said in, this, in his intervention, we need much more analytical analysis in order to make these connections because understanding these connections will make it possible to systematically seek and exploit synergies between Horizon Europe, cooperation programs, next generation funds, European regional funds, and other European national funds. And third, through the articulation of ecosystem-based missions or multi-actor share agendas oriented to address territorial challenges that are relevant for other territories and for the European Union. This is very important because aligning this bottom-up local and regional missions and share agendas with these initiatives and strategies or missions at EU level is key for interregional cooperation. And we think that through these ecosystem-based missions, regional actors can gain the necessary critical mass to engage in international networks, initiatives and projects, collaborating with other territories to generate this new knowledge, new solutions, new opportunities, and also markets for local companies. And as I said before, it's time to start talking about international value change in relation to solutions and in relation to alternatives to current and sustainable practices. Uh, so value change to address societal challenges. Thank you. Okay, Christoph, what, what do you think? So I try to make it extremely brief, hopefully. Uh, I think uh, our approach in the smart specialization strategy is on the one hand that we say uh, interdisciplinary cooperation is very much important. We need to do it in projects, but also, of course, in cross-border projects. We learned uh, that uh, in many cases, in, if, you, if it comes to S3, that the critical mass is really ma uh, lacking. So you have a lot of knowledge, but sometimes the critical mass is, is lacking 
tracking. And if you combine cross-border similarities uh, of different regions who have a similar smart specialization strategy and also a similar smart specialization focus, you enable completely new perspectives. And by doing so, you can uh, generate completely new solutions uh, in that settings. And that's also one of the reasons why we are, for instance, running um, an, an Alpen Space project in which we are developing across regional funding schemes. The idea of these funding schemes, and I do not want to go in depth, is uh, the follows that we have developed three different um, approaches, but the key message is more or less, you can cooperate in a cross-border way and cross-border um, and money doesn't cross the border. So it's, uh, it's a, um, an approach where you do not have really an administrative burden, partly very low, partly completely none and money is not crossing the border that's also interesting for regions uh, but still you can benefit from the from the benefits of these projects and consequently this could be a solution uh, using regular regional money and regional know-how combining this cross-border but keeping the money in the region um, and enable cross-border innovation so that's more or less my input on that way well, this is great. So the encouraging news is that all three regions are already on the internationalization agenda. You're already working on it. There are the S3 thematic platforms. There's the EU digitalization hubs. Uh, you need to map the connections and get shared agendas across actors. Um, you can... Um, develop cross-regional funding schemes and keep your money in, in your region, but uh, make sure that your partner region is, is putting their money into something where there's synergy. So it, it's a great story. Back to Alessandra. Sorry. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan, for moderating this panel discussion. And thank you very much to the, uh, um, to the experts and representative of the different regions. So um, yeah, we have uh, reached now the end of, the, of this webinar. Um, it's super difficult for me to provide like a, an overall conclusion because it was uh, really very intense uh, with a lot of inputs, many different levels. Uh, the EU, uh, the European Commission, the central government, regions, international organizations. So it's really a lot, a lot, a lot of input to reflect. But let me first start with an important duty, uh, which is uh, really thank you all for uh, um, participating in this uh, in event. It's really, uh, it's, it has been really a great pleasure to organize the event and to have you around this virtual table. Um, and I should also express my gratitude uh, to the interpreters who are doing uh, this uh, um, work on of making uh, this available in two languages, and to the regions that to the region Friuli Venezia Giulia who gave us the opportunity to work on uh, a bit more in depth on this topic and to bring together um, so many different brains uh, and experiences to to discuss. Um, as I said, uh, I mean, the, the, I think that the main word here is complexity um, of what we heard and uh, many different uh, um, uh, point of view, but they are all converging on one side on this, uh, um, I, I've just used keywords, no, uh, um, multi-level uh, participation. I think that multi-level was used uh, by uh, almost all the speakers. So this need of uh, integrating uh, different perspective and different responsibilities uh, um, and different actions. Uh, then, uh, <clears throat> so between coordination, coordination between regions and within regions uh, and also across regions. So with, by this, uh, uh, again, uh, um, uh, different involvement. So this, a, a lot of work uh, in, in the coordination side. Um, then we, we, we've heard from the experiences here of our, uh, in the panel of the cluster organizations and the importance also of creating, uh, of, of the need of skills and capacity at local level. Uh, um, not only skills in terms of implementing, but also skills in, 
needed for for uh, uh, managing this complexity and, and to engage uh, and keeping this coordination among different level different level of governments um uh, and then uh, something very interesting i think that was said was the importance of leaders uh political leaders that should champion uh, and also uh, believe in this strategy and bring those uh, elements all together um, and the need of uh, analysis to understand the connection. This was one of the last input I think that was uh, that were uh, uh, proposed uh, um, because uh, we need to better understand uh, how all this work uh, because there are many different uh, many different uh, um, uh, funds, there are many different uh, um, programs uh, and the, in, the importance to understand uh, how, uh, um, how this works and, and how to create the connection and what are the results of the connection, not only at the end, and here I go back to uh, Tito Bianchi's suggestion of uh, uh, the evaluation, uh, ex ante and not only ex post, uh, so to keep this already in mind from the, from the very beginning. Um, it was a bit random, uh, my conclusion, I just wanted really to uh, provide uh, some some keywords that were really attached to uh, remain to my to my mind there were many other things that were discussed uh, i guess the um, presentations and also the um, recordings of this uh, uh, event will be made available um, and i thank you very much and i also invite you to stay tuned on our uh, future activities because uh, uh, both uh, at the um, uh, with the forum uh, and the activities of the Center for Entrepreneurship SME regions uh, regions and cities, uh, the Trento Center, um, uh, the lead program. We are doing a lot of this uh, um, interesting webinars, uh, launching reports that are now available uh, also in many languages uh, that are really trying to bring together all this. Uh, all this net, uh, knowledge from different perspectives. So thank you again very much uh, um, to all of you for participating and for uh, animating such a, such a nice uh, um, debate. Bye bye and have, have a nice evening.